Good evening. How are you tonight? Again, may I have the privilege and the pleasure of coming into your home to visit with you for a little while. What would you like to talk about this evening on this anonymous telephone program? What subject is of concern to you? The Bible is our guidebook. The Bible is our authority, our resource book. No book in the world stands in the same shadow or in the same place with the Bible. It is the word of Almighty God. It is the law book that God has given to the human race so that we might know truth, that we might know the laws by which we are to live by, that we might know the consequence of not living by those laws, of disobeying those laws. Like any law book, you know, the, uh, there are statements uh, there that indicate a penalty for certain infractions, certain breaking of the law. That is also true of the law book that is called the Bible. God indicates there is a payment to be made. There's a penalty that will be assessed. Unfortunately, the law of God is so sacrosanct, it is so important, right? given the fact that man was created in the image of God and therefore should be totally obedient to God, and any infraction, any breaking of the law, it brings therefore enormous penalty, a penalty that is uh, beyond our imagination because uh, the whole matter of sin is so much more serious than we can ever imagine it. The penalty the Bible demands is eternal damnation, to be damned forever in hell. What a horrible, what a terrible punishment. But that's because sin is so incredibly terrible. It is rebellion against God who has created us in his likeness, uh, who has created us to serve him perfectly. Wonderfully, however, the Bible also shows us that God has a, provided a way of escape from that horrible punishment that we so rightly deserve. And that escape is through God himself in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is what the message of the gospel is all about, that the, we can be saved from the wrath of God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is the message that we and Family Radio uh, endeavor to send out with great uh, zeal, with great urgency. Because that day of judgment when mankind will have to answer for their sins has drawn very, very near. We can almost hear the trumpets of God sounding, uh, the fact that Christ is about to appear and the end of the world will be here. But marvelously, today, it's still the day of salvation. And so today... We want to use every means possible to get the gospel out to the world, that through the gospel, Christ will seek out and save those who are lost. Now, before we take our first question from our telephone lines, we have an interesting question from Berlin, Germany. I don't think we've ever had a question from there before. Uh, this our, our question concerns Romans chapter 2, verse 1. He says, please explain Romans 2, verse 1. I do not understand this verse because I know that we must make judgments in our life, such as the person that I want to marry. Is she a Christian or not? I hope you can help me understand this verse. Well, that's, this, this is a very, very important piece of information here in Romans chapter 2. Verse 1. Let me read a couple of verses here. Therefore, thou art inexcusable, O man, God is saying to us, whosoever thou art that judgeth, judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest doeth the same things. 
But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgeth them that do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God. God is explaining to us that mankind realizes that crimes have to be under judgment. It, it is not wrong at all that the governments of the world have appointed, uh, have laid down laws for the welfare of the populace. And it is not wrong at all that they have appointed certain men to judge the the conduct of the citizenry so that if they find that someone has broken the law that therefore uh, there must be penalty paid but what god is saying is that by virtue of the fact that we intuitively know there has to be judgment we are we should recognize that all crimes all sin is going to be judged the, the judge who has been appointed to pass judgment on someone because he has committed a crime, actually, if he would look at his own life in the light of the laws that God has laid down for his own life, would find that he, too, is breaking the law of God. And so the fact is, God is saying the nature of men, we are created in the image of God, is to recognize there has to be accountability for our lives. We see this in the way we conduct our lives uh, as we have judges and as we have penalties for crime. But then we ought to recognize there is a judge that we all have to stand before. And we can't stick our head in the sand like the proverbial ostrich and hope it will go away. There is a who is examining everybody's life, my life and your life and everybody's life, and he's going to find sin there. He's going to find crime because not one human being lives perfectly before God. And any time we are less than perfect, it is sin. And sin, the Bible, the law, book of God, uh, uh, is, uh, calls for a penalty. And that penalty is super awful because sin is so super awful. It's eternal damnation. And so God is telling us in Romans 2, look, the very, by virtue of the very fact that you make judgments that is, the, hum the human race ha recognizes the, the need to make judgments and does make judgments, uh, and, uh, indicates that we also have to stand before God and face the judgment of God. And unfortunately, God knows every sin we would ever commit. He knows every deed, evil deed we've ever done. He knows every evil word we've ever spoken. He knows every evil thought we've ever thought about. He even knows the intents of our heart before that even has developed into an actual uh, evil thought or an evil word or an evil deed. And any of this and all of us to this together puts us under the wrath of God so that the, the situation of the human race is indescribable, terrible. It's in an awful situation, and it is so wonderful that in the setting of this terrible situation, God has provided a Savior. And in order for Christ to be our Savior, it means that each one that he saves, their sins have to be laid upon Christ. And he actually had to bear the wrath of God, demanded by the law of God for those sins, and, and, and take that punishment upon himself. And only because he has done that 
can he forgive that individual for his sins and and make him his own child and bring him into heaven without that person ever having to face the judgment throne on his own behalf that is what the salvation gospel is all about this is what we are so anxious to tell the whole world uh, because we know that out there there's a great multitude this is the language of the bible there's a great multitude which no man can number that god is presently saving well thank you berlin germany for that very important question and now shall we take our first call from our telephone lines good evening welcome to open forum Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. Good evening. Oh my, we're having a trouble, a problem with our telephone lines. Let's try it once more. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. Well, let me... Well, we're waiting for them to straighten out the telephone lines here. Yes. Hello. Hello. Hello? How you doing, Mr. Campion? Yes, we are. We got you on the line. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, can you read Jeremiah seventeen eleven? Jeremiah chapter seventeen, verse eleven. Let's look at that. Jeremiah seventeen, verse eleven. We read. Uh, let's start with verse 9. Jeremiah 17, verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked who can know it. I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins. And the reins is another synonym for the heart, or the very essence of mankind. Even to give every man according to his ways, and according to the fruit of his doings. That's exactly what we've just been talking about. Now the next verse, verse 11. As the partridge sitteth on eggs and hatcheth them not, so he that getteth riches and not by right shall leave them in the midst of his days, and at his end shall be a fool. Is that the verse? Yes. Yes, that's a very interesting way of God is putting it. The fact is... And the desire of mankind is to accumulate all the riches that he can have. Uh, and that those riches could constitute of material wealth. It can constitute of uh, a rich philosophy that they think they have developed or a rich uh, uh, solution to their sin pro problem that they have developed. Uh, they and, and they're, of course, looking for the the uh, culmination or the end of all of their efforts so that they might have utopia that they might have the more abundant life in some way but the fact is they will be it's like the partridge like the bird that's sitting on the eggs they'll never hatch because uh, uh, right in the middle of the acquiring of these riches whatever the riches may be God comes to take that person in death and at the or he comes at the end of the world whichever comes first and that person is left uh, uh, without ever seeing a a the, the glorious hope that he had had because of the riches which he had accumulated by his efforts the only riches that can bring utopia the more abundant life is that which is a gift of God, and a completely unearned gift of God. It is the gift of salvation. Okay, I have a, another topic I want to dis discuss with you. I've been listening on, uh, since I've been out the congregation on Sundays, out of parties, out of the, the church, I've been listening to... Uh, um, Preaching on the television is this television show TBN, and another and another show I've been listening to, and I heard this teacher mention uh, teaching about paradise and hell, and a uh, and a rich man and Lazarus, and that paradise that in hell there was two places paradise there was a paradise in hell, 
and that there was a, and, and 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 was on the other side of the hell was was with uh, wait a minute. Yeah, well, excuse it was me. A, it was a, I, I, let me explain. I, I'm aware of what you were taught, and that what you have been taught is absolutely not true to the Word of God. The Bible tells us where paradise is. Remember, Jesus said to the thief next to him who became saved just uh, 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 an hour before he uh, before he died Jesus said today thou shalt be with me in paradise now what happens what is the destination of anyone who becomes saved when they die we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 8 to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Uh, and we read in 2 Corinthians 12 where Paul was caught up into the third heaven into paradise. And, uh, and that third heaven has to do with the heaven where God is. Paradise is heaven. It is where we go when we die if we're a true believer and we live and reign with Christ there until the last day and then we come with him uh, from uh, heaven in in our soul existence because our body of course has been returned to the to the uh, to the earth and has uh, returned back to dust but we come with Christ in our soul existence and receive our glorified spiritual body Paradise is not a compartment of hell of some kind. That whole, that whole mechanism that is being taught uh, is uh, is taught by those who really have not looked carefully at all at the Bible. Uh, can you explain um, how come uh, David in uh, Psalm 16 today, uh, God will not leave his soul in hell, and also that Jesus. He said he would be uh, three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Well, the, first of all, the heart of the earth is, uh, is, uh, is uh, not down there someplace. When we follow Christ in the atonement, he, 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 God began to pour out his wrath on him on Thursday evening while he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he, uh, he at that time was saying, Abba, Father, is it possible that this cup... Uh, that it would be the cup of God's wrath might pass from him. He was throwing himself to the ground with great cries, and his sweat was pouring from his body like great drops of blood into the ground. And then, of course, it reaches a crescendo when he's hanging on the cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He was enduring hell. And three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, the heart of the earth is a figure of speech that is speaking about hell. But hell was not a place at that time. It is, a, it is the condition of being under the wrath of God. And Christ was under the wrath of God. When he said, as he was hanging on the cross, he said, it is finished. It means, meant that the penalty had been paid and then uh, he said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. To be absent from the body is to be present in the, with the Lord. His body was put in the grave. It did not see corruption. Uh, but on Sunday morning, he arose as a whole personality as the proof that he had fully endured hell for our sins. And, and if we go from Thursday night to Sunday morning, we get three days and three nights. We have Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night. We have all day Friday, all day Saturday, partial day Sunday. That's counted as a day. And you get three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. But he, under no circumstance did he go to a place called hell. Uh, there's, there, when we follow him on the cross, step by step, as long as he was... Uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was very much alive. When he stood before Pontius Pilate and Caiaphas, and uh, he was very much alive. When he hung on the cross, he was very much alive. Until he said, it is finished. And then uh, they examined his body right after that, and remember, and he had died. 
Uh, he had gone to be with the, his father in heaven. And so there was never a time when he went to a place called hell. Okay, uh, last question. It's Psalm 16, verse 10. Where is that? Where is hell at there? It says, for thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. Well, the hell is, we could paraphrase it this way, now that we understand that hell is being under the wrath of God. Incidentally, on the last day when God casts the unsaved into hell, there will be a place called hell simply because the, uh, the unsaved have to have to be there forevermore under the wrath of God and they can't be with the believers who are in the new heaven and the new earth they have to be some other place and then that place can be called hell but right now there is no hell because but there are, every human being by nature is under the wrath of God that's where God finds us he finds us in hell but the uh, the uh, uh, when Christ was enduring the wrath of God, he it, he was he was in hell spiritually. He was in hell, and God did not leave him there. In other words, once the penalty was fully paid, God uh, 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 Christ, who is eternal God, could say it is finished. He did not continue to be under the wrath of God once the penalty was fully paid. His soul was not left in hell. Okay, God bless you and praise the Lord. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome hello? to Open Forum. Uh, hello, Brother uh, Camping? Yes. And it's really a pleasure and a privilege to be able to speak to you tonight. I'd like to ask you if you'd do something for me, and that is expound upon this uh, place that uh, I understood you to say uh, soul, the same soul goes that's uh, quiet and not, it's not uh, going directly to heaven. I, I'm sorry, is your radio on? We're getting a lot of noise on it. Well, I'll turn the volume down. Don't yeah. worry. Uh, please turn your radio sure. off. Sure. Turn it off, John. Yeah. Turn it off. I yell it to you, Emmy. Let's yeah. try it now. You, you, you're asking me, uh, what is your question you're asking me? I'm asking you about where this place is. If you'd expound upon that, uh, what you were saying one time about the soul going to a place of silence. Yes, that's Psalm 115. So, uh, let, let me check that. Let me, Psalm 115, you say? Excuse me, let me look at that. I haven't looked at it for a long time. And there we read in, let's see, Psalm 115, yes, verse 17, verse 17 of Psalm 115, The dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down into silence. Now, why do they go into silence? Because when, they, when a person dies and he's not saved, uh, he, he can't stand before the judgment throne yet because that is at the end of the world. His body, of course, goes into the grave and returns to dust. His soul, in his soul existence, he can't go into heaven because he's not saved. So it goes into a place of silence. He has no conscious existence, either in his body or his soul. But on the last day, he will be resurrected a whole personality, both body and soul, the body from the dust of the earth, the, the soul from a place of silence, and he will stand as a whole person before God to answer for his sins. I certainly thank you, Brother Campy, for that explanation. I think it was excellent. Well, thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes. Is this Brother Campy? This is he. Go ahead with your oh. call. Okay, I've been trying to get you for a long time. Um, to be present, I mean, to be present with, I mean, to be absent from the body and present with God, is, does that mean present in judgment? Is it possible that I can be in pres present in judgment and not present? Because where does the unrighteous go, you know what I mean? Does that, well, for them to, to be present in heaven? No. Or, I mean, what? What, no, let's let's uh, let's start from the beginning. You see, before we are saved, 
our personality essentially consists of a body and a soul. We see the body uh, and the soul we can't see, but that is what gives us life. And uh, and uh, if you ever were present when somebody died, at one moment they have personality, even though they may even be in a coma. But then the next moment the breath has stopped, the body begins to grow cold and decay, and uh, and uh, there is no no uh, life. You, you sense something has left the body. Well, what has left the body is the soul. Uh, that, that is actually what physical death is for the believer, or excuse me, for the human being. It's a separation of soul and body, and the st and the ending of, of of the breath of life. All right. Now, in the case of the believer, the body goes into the grave uh, because it has not yet become saved. But in his soul existence, he had been given eternal life at the moment of salvation. And so he immediately is brought into heaven to continue to live and rejoice and, and reign with Christ in heaven in his soul existence. That's because he had been given eternal life at the moment of salvation. On the other hand, the unsaved person at death also experiences the separation of soul and body. His body goes into the grave and returns to the dust. But in his soul, he can't go into heaven because he uh, has never become saved. He doesn't have eternal life. Uh, and he can't stand before the judgment throne because that, that day of ju judgment will only come when Christ returns at the end of the world. So the soul goes to a place of silence. Uh, it, uh, it's uh, to await the end of the world. And then at the end of the world, at Christ's command, that person as a whole personality will be resurrected to stand for judgment. Simultaneously, the bodies of the true believers who, who in their soul existence have been living and reigning with Christ in heaven, uh, they their bodies will be resurrected, a glorified spiritual body, and their bodies will be caught up to be with Christ. Christ in the air, so that again they're a whole personality with Christ. Um, Brother Camden, um, can you show me in the Bible or wherever where they talk about this place of silence? Yeah, hold on just a minute. We're gonna, uh, I'll be right back with you right after this message. weekday at this time, we bring you Open Forum, a telephone talk program airing questions on biblical issues. This feature of Family Stations Incorporated will continue in just a moment. Through the Bible in a Year is not just another daily Bible reading guide. For one thing, instead of skipping back and forth between the Old and New Testaments, you'll be reading from the beginning to the end of the Bible in the order of its events. This will greatly help you to understand the historical context in which each passage was written. For instance, you will learn which epistles were written at what time in Paul's ministry as you read them in the midst of reading the book of Acts. To get a free copy of Through the Bible, in a year, just call 1-800-543-1495. That's 1-800-543-1495. Or write to Family Radio, Oakland, California, 94621, USA. We continue with more of the Open Forum. You are invited to call in and ask questions or discuss issues that are related to the Bible. Our number is 1-800-322-5385. That's 1-800-322-5385. When your call goes on the air, please be ready to turn your volume down. Here is our host and Bible teacher, Harold Camping. We read in Psalm 115, Psalm 115 in verse 17, 
the dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down into silence. Now, the, the, this is talking about the spiritual dead. The, the true believers, they are alive. We are given eternal life at the moment of saving, salvation. We praise God here in our body as we live out our, the rest of our lives in our bodies. And the moment that we die, we go to be with Christ and we praise God in heaven because we have eternal life. We, we don't die. But the dead, they are spiritually dead, first of all, and, and uh, when they die physically, they can't go into heaven, uh, uh, but they go down to a place of silence. Now, keeping that in mind, go to John 5, John 5, verse uh, 28. John 5, verse 28, and then we'll read what the next event is. We read there... In John 5, verse 28, Marvel not at this, Jesus is saying, for the hour is coming, that is, there's a time coming, not a whole lot of times, there is a time coming. The hour is coming in which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice. Well, now, who's in the graves? Well, everyone who has ever lived on the face of the earth during the last 13,000 years since creation and who has died are going to hear his voice. And shall come forth they that have done good under the resurrection of life. And the Bible explains in other passages that they will be resurrected a glorified spiritual body and go to be with the Lord. But then it goes on. Let me read the verse again. And shall come forth they that have done good under the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil, they are the unsaved, those who died uh, uh, without salvation, they that have done evil unto the resurrection of of damnation. In other words, they're going to be resurrected from the grave as a whole personality. Where did their soul come from? Their body came out of the dust of the earth. Their soul came from uh, uh, wherever the place of silence is. And now they stand again as a whole personality to be Judged, And in other words, when a, an unsaved person dies, and this is, this is really terrible to contemplate, but it is the fact. When an unsaved person dies, he may have been suffering a lot in this life. He may have thought that death was a wonderful release. It means that I'll never, never suffer any longer. But what he's going to find out is the next thing he consciously knows he is standing at the judgment throne of God as a whole personality, and God is judging him for all of his sins, and the sentence we know what it'll be, eternal damnation, a way to hell forevermore. That is why we so desperately send the gospel out, because that's the only antidote, antidote for this. Right. Well, I thank you, Brother Campbell, for answering my question. Uh, I've been trying to get you for a while. I've been like a seven-day Adventist for most of my life, and uh, not too long ago, um, I've been just discovered the uh, theory on predestination, and I believe in 100 percent. And I just want to tell you, just keep on doing what you're doing. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, good evening. How you doing? Very well, thank you. Uh, just a side note, in years past when you called in, um, you used to be able to put it on hold, and, but what's happening now is you're calling, uh, the rings finally stop, and then you have to call back. I don't know if there's anything wrong with your phones or not. No, I'll tell you what is happening. This is something that we have no control over. Uh, the lines load up. You see a lot of people are trying to call, and so this loads up all the equipment of the phone company, and so after it rings so many times, they they drop the, drop the call out, oh, okay. and you have to call again. And, uh, but years past, you used to be able to be put on hold. So well, I know that was in the early days when we didn't have nearly as many people right. trying to get in as we have today. The reason why I called is uh, I'm a 46 year old male, 
Uh, I've been listening to family radio from my early 30s, and obviously, like many people, I've benefited greatly from the uh, the station as well as your teaching. Um, I've grown leaps and bounds uh, because of the ministry. Um, there's one thing that I heard you say last night that I think is problematic, and it seems to me that when you look at certain particular verses that maybe you're not doing some of the kinds of things that you do in a lot of other of your study areas as far as looking at things in context. I just wanted to read a couple verses and get your feelings on it. Um, one, one verse you mentioned last night, I'll get to in a second, but I want to read one here. Hebrews 13.1 says, Let brotherly love continue. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. And obviously, the strangers and the angels are synonymous, and when you entertain or you minister, uh, that person may end up being a child of God, even though you may not have thought uh, that they were at that time. And it seems to me that the word angels there is being used as a euphemism for God's elect. And also, in Hebrews 1, which you commented on last night, it says in Hebrews 1.14, Aren't they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them, who are the elect, who shall be heirs of salvation? Now, the only ministering that's going on on this planet is when we bring the word of God to one another, or it's shared with us. Uh, and, we, and we get saved, as you know, through the Word of God. And I'm just curious why you continue to teach almost kind of a little bit of a dichotomy that we're all responsible for our own sin, yet you claim that there's this angelic kingdom which is affecting us all negatively, which I've looked at every word in the Bible having to do with angels, and I don't see it. Well, uh, if you are correct in uh, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 1. Uh, the word angel uh, is a, in the Greek, is a angelus, which can be translated messenger. And every true believer is a messenger. Uh, and Christ himself is the messenger of the covenant. And, uh, and uh, uh, wherever we see the word angel, in, and in the Old Testament, it's the Hebrew word malach, and uh, that too is the the first meaning is messenger but the fact is there are angels uh, f uh, there are those angels that have rebelled against god and there are angels who have not rebelled against god there are for example when god uh, 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 when when christ was born and we see the angelic hosts that are that are uh, let's let's read uh, let's read let's see what's how that language of Luke two is says uh, as it speaks uh, there and, and it's it's uh, we, we read in Luke two uh, in uh, uh, in, in uh, verse eight and there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field keeping watch over their flock by night and lo the angel of the Lord came upon them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them and they were sore afraid and the angel said unto them fear not for behold I bring you good tidings of great joy which shall be to all people for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord and this shall be a sign unto you ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace uh, goodwill toward men now we we uh, have to admit we don't know a whole lot about angels we do know that the very fact that the evil spirits exist and they started out as angels they rebelled against god uh, and therefore the, the we know that definitely there is the existence of angels and we have no reason no good biblical reason to look upon a passage like luke 2 as being anybody but but an angelic host who uh, and or, and uh, it, it is true that uh, that we can uh, try to decide but wherever we see the angel actually it's talking about the spirits of men who are in men and women who are in heaven uh, because they're in their soul existence there's only a few people in heaven in their glorified spiritual bodies and we could say this is it's talking about them but we don't have any good proof of that at all uh, it and uh, and I think we're not at all 
uh, uh, we're not at all uh, amiss in recognizing there is an angelic host that, and uh, but uh, we on the other side uh, there is a caution, and and that is today, for example, a lot of folk make a whole lot of about angels. They they're really uh, obsessed with the idea of angels, and that's bad. That's terribly bad. The focus has to be on the Lord Jesus. You know, angels don't save us. Christ does. But the fact that the Bible uh, speaks uh, frequently about angels, and many times it should have been translated messenger because uh, it may be God himself who is in view. But at other times, uh, we have to say, well, uh, that's, that, that is, is not necessarily God. It, it, it could be an angel. On that passage in Luke, and I looked at the Greek on this, that angelic kingdom that came down from heaven was already the elect who was dead who came down in their soul existence. This was not a separate angelic uh, oh, oh, body that came down. Oh, I've worked what, with the Greek in me, there. Excuse me, how do you read that? It doesn't say that. Well, because when you go through the scripture, just as you teach, and you deal with all the words having to do with angel, what you see is that is exactly what happened is that the angelic body that came down was the dead elect but, but let me ask well you excuse me it's not talking about the elect here you can read that into that if you wish but it doesn't talk about the elect here it talks it just uses the word messenger right uh, that's it, in the word angelus and and you can read into that elect if you wish but it doesn't say that and it's and so we got it we we uh, we don't want to uh, we uh, uh, actually we we uh, don't want to read more into it than what is there. Right, but what you do is you do exactly what you teach, and what you do is you look at the totality of the scripture, both in the Hebrew and the Greek meanings, and you look at all the words where you see angel, and it, and in and in my spiritual walk, there's no doubt in my mind, and this is just my opinion, I've come to the conclusion that that the only angelic body that exists is the dead elect who are already in heaven. But let me ask you a question. When a person commits a sin, let's say a pastor's in the pulpit and he's malfeasant in his duties related to what he's preaching about the scripture, or uh, somebody commits a murder or thinks evil in their heart, who's responsible for that sin? Is it the individual or is it Satan? Oh, it is the individual. Well, it then why are you teaching that there's a satanic kingdom out there that has great influence in causing us to, to commit sin? Either we're responsible for our own sin, or we're not. If Satan's out there influencing us, then that's a mitigating factor towards us committing our sin. Oh, well, the fact is that all we have to do is go back to the Garden of Eden, and there we see it was Eve and Adam's sin when they rebelled against God even though Satan was there uh, tempting them and, uh, and baiting them into sin. It was his sin also. But Eve, uh, uh, Satan doesn't, isn't accountable for, for Eve's sin or Adam's sin. They're accountable for their own sin. Well, that's exactly Likewise, what... Satan is accountable for his sin. He is accountable for his sin. And so we're not... Uh, there are people who say, well, Satan made me do it, as if that is uh, excusing their sin. And that won't stand at all. Every human being is accountable for his own sin. Well, when, when, the, Lord, when the Lord said to Peter, when, when Peter did not want Jesus to go into Jerusalem to be eventually crucified, and the Lord said to him, get behind me, Satan, was he, tell, was he admonishing Peter for his actions against Jesus, or was he admonishing Satan? He was admonishing Peter. Peter was acting as Satan would act, and therefore Christ does that frequently in the Bible. He gives a person a name uh, to help uh, understand their actions. For Absolutely. example, we find... Uh, Christ is called David in the Old Testament because Christ is the beloved one, and the name David means beloved. Uh, Christ is called Cyrus in uh, in uh, Isaiah 45 or 46 because he was uh, typified by Cyrus. But but uh, here say, uh, Christ is calling Peter Satan not because he had become Satan, not because Satan is even working in this. Satan is not even involved in this sin of uh, of of uh, uh, 
Peter at this moment, but he is simply acting in a way that Satan would be pleased to act. But the sin was Peter's sin. But that was exactly the same word in the Greek, adversary, that is used in other places for the word Satan. But let me read you one other verse that you use, and then I'll be done, that you use very frequently in your writings that I believe you're misinterpreting. In Jude chapter uh, Jude 1, 5, the Lord says, I will therefore put in remembrance, though ye once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believe not. And that's obviously talking about the Jews that came out of Egypt. And then it says, And the angels who kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved into everlasting chains unto darkness unto the judgment of the great day. And then the Lord says, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Now, reading in context the way you teach, this is talking about the Jews who came out of Egypt, who were destroyed in the wilderness, and they are the angels who lost their first estate. These are, this is not talking about an angelic kingdom of Satan's who lost their first estate state and who are in hell or some place with everlasting chains bonding them which would be a contradiction if they're out there actually doing evil well, excuse me excuse me the fact is that is talking here first of all about those who came out of Egypt uh, uh, that is illustration number one number two illustration number two he's talking about the angels that rebelled uh, and and uh, and were cast into hell, uh, hell, which matches the language of Revelation 20, verse 1. Illustration number 3, Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, that they were destroyed. And uh, so you can read this any way you wish to read it, but I'll tell you, the language is very clear. There are These are three distinct illustrations that God is given that uh, that uh, is emphasizing that there is judgment that will come upon those who sin but thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum hello yes i have a uh, brother canton i'm um, also like when people call you know how that the, that, you, that the lines go off and, and stuff like that i understand that but also when some people talk and maybe you should give them like a certain time no more than 15 maybe minutes or something like that but I wanted to, uh, to make a comment first yes. and I have two questions the guy that was just talking he said something about the angels he said well he thought the angels were um, those um, Christians that, that die and that are in heaven but angels means um, messenger anglos so they're not angels because messengers are we who are alive and are actually out there spreading the word of God well excuse me the fact is God uh, God can certainly use angels we find for example when when Christ arose and uh, and there uh, and the uh, women came to the tomb there were two men in white standing there who are they who are they well it could be God himself or they could be angels who took on a, an appearance of a, of a human in order to bring a message we already looked at Luke 2 where we saw that the angelic host that uh, the, uh, that they uh, were praising God and, and, and saying. And so we, uh, the Bible, the, the Bible uh, uh, is speaking about angels. But remember this, there's a lot of mystery. We are living on this earth in a very finite world where, where we see flesh and blood and we see material things. And we have really no knowledge of spiritual things. An angel is a spirit being. A devil is a spiritual being. When we have died and gone to be with Christ, we are living with Christ as a spirit being. We don't understand that. We, Our, our finite minds cannot understand that. But we read the language of the Bible and, and we don't try to... Uh, uh, we, we uh, uh, read it very carefully, 
but uh, we don't uh, we definitely see that there are angels there's there's no argument about that there the devils are fallen angels there's no we we uh, if anyone argues about that they're just not not uh, they, they've made up their mind about something and and are trying to make every passage fit their preconceived idea but at the same time as we talk about angels or talk about spirit beings or whatever we have to admit we we read the language of the Bible and and yet to really demonstrate or, or or draw pictures of it we can't do that because we don't know enough about spirit beings. Hello, Brother Kempin. Hello. Yes. Okay, I'm sorry. Maybe you misunderstood me. I know all, everything that you explained. I understand that because I read the Bible every day, and and I believe not because you say it. It's because from what I read from the Bible, and I understand that it, there, there's mystery there with angels, and I know that God created angels as a separate being. But what I was saying is, he, this person I was talking, said that angels could. Um, he was comparing them, saying that they're actually the Christians that have died. Now, Christians that have died are not angels because they're not messengers now. When they're in heaven, they're not bringing out messages to I think, us. I think that's a very uh, fair point. I think that's a good point that you're making. Uh, okay. Our, uh, the messengers that come to us uh, today are, uh, are uh, there is the Bible itself that is the message, and we are the messengers. And okay. secondly, you know, he was, uh, when we talk about the book of Jude, he's saying these angels that, kept not their yeah. first estate well it's uh, those who have kept not their first estate are uh, they're not the elect of god under no circumstance they are they are uh those who uh, uh the unsaved who who end up in uh, under the wrath of god were never the elect of god hello brother campen i need to ask you a question about the end of the church age yes okay um i understand about the end of the church age and ever since i've been listening to uh, family radio that they're proclaiming this message and um um and every time i i read the bible every day i have an, an hour or so that i read the bible and every time I come to certain passages, for example, I'm in Jeremiah, and also even in the Genesis and in the Psalms, like in Psalm 74, I see all of this, like about the church age ending, and about um, the sanctuary building um, being um, cast to the ground. And um, and I understand all of that, but the thing that um, sometimes I wonder is, because I don't know other Christians around me that know that that believe this. And I don't go to church anymore because of this. And sometimes all I have is um, family radio, and it's just not like you know, like the flesh there, people. But I understand that I'm I'm being, um, I mean, I'm with other Christians that we are in one mind with Christ. But is it wrong to feel that way sometimes, like you're alone and that there's no one around you to actually yeah. flesh and blood? Well, but you see. I, this is the nature of Bible truth. If we come to any understanding, it's because God has given us that understanding. Now, it is not a matter of consensus. When Elijah had been given understanding of truth and the 450 prophets of Baal that were contesting with him on Mount Carmel, they did not have the truth. And Elijah stood all alone, all alone. And, and again and again, this is the situation that we can stand all alone. Now, because the Bible uh, shows us that God has a progressive revelation, it's all in the Bible, it's been there for 2,000 years, but uh, we can't understand any of the Bible until God opens our spiritual ears and eyes, and and... Uh, and when he begins to open it, uh, uh, additional revelation to the body of believers, it doesn't mean that suddenly every true believer in the whole world immediately understands this. For example, we read in Ephesians 3 about the Apostle Paul. Now, uh, the, the Bible had recorded again and again in the Old Testament, and Jesus had emphasized this, that the gospel was going to go into all the world. And yet the Apostle Paul writes in, in the, in, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in Ephesians 3, like he's the only one who has come to understanding. A mystery has been revealed to me, uh, namely that the gospel is to go to all the nations. There are going to be people from every nation that will become saved. Uh, 
it, 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 and, and so it, it be like waves, uh, like when you throw a stone into the water and you see the ripples that, that go out in all, in all directions and are clear across the lake. That's the same way these truths are. They, they begin in a small way someplace and then because it is truth, they magn they more and more and more and more people begin to understand this and uh, and as in the in the remaining years between now and the end we're going to see uh, um, uh, uh, considerable more people understanding this who presently don't understand this but it takes some time god has his own timetable for each one in opening their spiritual eyes to this truth but brother campin but um, I do have that hope, though, like in my heart, even though I feel that this way sometimes, that I know that one day, regardless, if, if I never meet other people in the flesh and blood that I could talk to, um, you know, more often or whatever, that we will all be together one day, if the Lord permits me, that we'll all be together and, and when we get to see Him and we get to eternity and we'll all be together and it'll all be worth it and we'll see that this was just nothing, it's just a drop in the bucket. Well, you'll, you, there's no question at all when Christ comes on the last day all the true believers will be together they will be the only ones who have been raptured to be with Christ in the air and eternally we will be together forevermore but thank, thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please good evening Welcome. Mr. Camping yes there are two things I'd like to stick with you today uh, first of all let us talk about what you are telling the whole world and uh, that is the thing that is bothering me because I am a Christian just as you are a Christian but here you saying talking about eternity you say that God has chosen a certain number of people to be saved he has come down on earth he has died only for them, for no one else, just for those whom he has chosen in his salvation plan. You said those will be saved because God has committed himself to saving those. No more, just those. And then, that I can understand. Now, I don't have any problem with that if that's the way God wants to do it. This is God. He's, the, he's, he's God. But then you come up and tell us something that seems to me to be totally different. you saying, even tonight, for example, you say that if you were taking the gospel uh, to the world, and then the, the, the people who are, who, who are not saved, they will have a chance to be saved. In other words, it seems to me you're telling the world two things. Number one, God has chosen those people to be saved. They will be saved regardless, as you said once, regardless whether they, they want to be saved. Each weekday at this time, we bring you Open Forum, a telephone talk program airing questions on biblical issues. This feature of Family Stations Incorporated will continue in just a moment. Family Radio's family extends around the world. The latest Family Radio news focuses on our international ministry and how it got started. In this issue, along with our program guide and regular features, you'll have an opportunity to meet some of those involved in our international department. The manager producers, translators, and voices that proclaim the good news worldwide. And you'll find letters of listeners from around the globe. For your free copy of this and future issues of the Family Radio News, call 1-800-543-1495. That's 1-800-543-1495 or write to Family Radio, Oakland, California, 94621. We continue with more of the Open Forum. 
You are invited to call in and ask questions or discuss issues that are related to the Bible. Our number is 1-800-322-5385. That's 1-800-322-5385. When your call goes on the air, please be ready to turn your volume down. Here is our host and Bible teacher, Harold Camping. We have a caller on the line who is asking a very good question. If indeed God has a very precise elective program where he named every human being he planned to save and obligated himself to save them and therefore they will become saved without any question, then why do we send the gospel out? Why do we uh, try to reach as many people as possible with the gospel and tell them there is a possibility that they too might become saved? We must remember that this is God's program, not ours. We don't dictate to God how to do it. He has, is telling us why we do become saved. If we do become saved, he's telling us it's because you were elected of God. And therefore God had obligated himself to save you and therefore you did become saved. But on the other hand, he is not telling us who the elect are who are still unsaved. And we know that out in the, in the wor world there are a great many who are elect of God. We have no idea who they are. And we know that they have to hear the gospel. And those who are elect of God uh, in time will become saved. But the God's divine economy calls for the fact that they have to hear the gospel. It's not our business to know who it is. We just have to faithfully, and this is a command that he gives to the true believers, the command is, go ye into all the world with the gospel. And we can uh, go there uh, with the message that God is saving a great multitude, which no man can number. Uh, and we can tell them why they became saved if they do become saved. And we can tell them that uh, that uh, there is a possibility that anyone might be saved, but we don't know who they are. Only God knows. But but listen, listen to the word of God. Listen, and and if God plans to save you, it is through the word that He will save you. And so it's uh, we have to be very careful that we don't try to tell God how to do it. We have to simply obey, obey. And while the whole program of salvation is 100% God's program, we, on the other hand, have been given an express command, go ye into all the world with the gospel. And so we must do that. We, the only uh, tangible connection we can see is that we do know that in order for God to finish his work of saving those whom he has elected, he has to bring these people under the hearing of the gospel. And by God's divine economy, his, by his divine mercy, by his divine providence, he permits and commands, as a matter of fact, the true believers to be the vehicle, the means by which that gospel gets out there so that it can reach those whom God plans to save. Mr. Kemping, you know, you, you said something that I did not exactly say, because uh, when you say, why take the gospel? No, I know we should take the gospel, because Jesus Christ told us, he commanded that. He, he taught his apostles, and he told his apostles, go and make other disciples. And he told, he gave them the, 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 the order to go out and, uh, and, and bring the gospel throughout the world. But he also used the word, any, when he said any, you know, he who believes. But then uh, you in your teaching, you are modifying the word any as though it is not any as we human beings know the word any. It's as though it's an any that was already prearranged. You understand what I'm getting at? Oh, I understand perfectly. You see, we, as we send out the gospel, 
we have to bear in mind this is God's salvation plan. It's not ours. It's God's salvation plan. And he has very clearly told us that he didn't, uh, he didn't name everyone in the Lamb's Book of Life. We, we read that in, the, in Revelation chapter 17. There are those who have never been named there. And he clearly talks about those who have been elected about of God and have been given by the Father to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have all that information. And so uh, that's, that's, that's knowledge that God has given us. And therefore we, we keep that in mind as we send out the gospel. And when God uses the word any or all, we have to read it. Uh, those words in the light of what we can know that it's any that God has elected that that remains the uh, the uh, determining uh, number that we can't get past that there there are the elect and nobody can get past that that's that's what God has determined and we have to recognize that and if we don't like that word election and and are, are trying to uh, make it something different, then we're simply saying, Oh, Lord, we know, we understand quite a bit about your salvation plan, but we really don't like it. We really don't like it. We really think it ought to be this or that. And we, but the fact is that in our, in our humble uh, observance of God's laws, in our humble serving God as his, as his uh, people, we say, oh, Lord, you teach me, you teach me what it all, what this is all about, and, uh, and we'll try to be faithful in carrying out your command. That's all what we're trying to do. So when, so when you say, for example, now I have one more thing to ask you after that. When you say, for example, that you, Harold Camping, you are absolutely sure that you are saved, in other words, you have no doubt in your mind that when you die, you will wind up in heaven. So this is the stance that you have. But then you say that no one can go to heaven unless that person has been a pre-elect by God. And then you say that you, Harold Camping, you do not know whether you are a pre-elect by God, but then you are saying you are absolutely sure when you die, you are going to be saved in heaven. Oh, so excuse me, excuse me, now, 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 you're getting, you're making a contradiction there. If a person has become saved, one thing he does know, and remember the Bible says God's Spirit witnesses with our spirits that we are sons of God. And we do uh, get, see the evidence in our life as we have this uh, tremendous desire to be faithful to everything the Bible teaches and so on. But we also know that the only reason that I have become saved, and I'll speak very personally, the only reason I know I have become saved is because God elected me. If he had not elected me, I never would have become saved. It's, and, and because he elected me, therefore he saved me. And, and had there not been, had he not elected me, I never would have become saved. There's, there's no misunderstanding there at all. Why do you say that you do not know whether you are pre-elected? I didn't say that. I've never said that. I, oh, 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 I, I, I know without any question I have been elected of, of God. That is the basis of my salvation. You said and, nobody and, knows. Uh, excuse me. Uh, and therefore, I cannot take any credit for it of any kind. Now, please, don't try to put words into my mouth. I'm telling you that I have never, never said I don't know whether I was elected or not. And before I was saved, yes, I would not have known whether I was elected. But once we have that certainty of salvation, that assurance of salvation, we know that the basis of that is that God had to elect me, otherwise it, I would not be saved. Let me ask you the last question. You talk about the churches, the days of the church is over. Okay, uh, if you say the days of the church are over, but the people who are running churches, I am not a, uh, I did not invent any church, but whether it is uh, first, second, or third, or fourth Baptist, whatever they are, or Catholic, or pro, whatever Protestant church, 
those people who had uh, from the church, they used the Bible to use certain phrase in order for them to form the church. Now here you are, you say it is not a church, uh, but still you are using the Bible, but then here you are, you make yourself very well fitted. In other words, you are the president for life, you are the general manager for life, you have a position that you know nobody at Family Radio has the power to get you out. Aren't you some kind of a... And you you sending things to, to people and you asking us as members? And well, well, when excuse we me, excuse me, please. What in the world does ha have to do with the fact that I'm president or general manager of Family Radio? I don't answer... I don't answer to man, I answer to God. I have to face God, and that is everything. That is everything. And incidentally, think about this program. No preacher, no Bible teacher exposes himself, as I do, five nights a week, where anybody like yourself or anyone else can call in and critique or criticize or examine or raise questions or whatever. Nobody does that. But I do it because I don't want people to trust me. I, they, they have to find their trust in the Bible. And if they can fault me in something, fine. I'm glad to be corrected because all I care about is truth. And I'm not a superman. I, I can be in error. And if I'm in error, I wouldn't hesitate to admit I have been in error. But, uh, but, I, there's, what's the point of emphasizing I'm president or general manager? That isn't, uh, if God wants to remove me, you know, this business of bringing the gospel is not a man-made kind of a thing. God is the one who sets things up. I don't know why he picked a, a, a common ordinary person like me and, and, and put me in this kind of a position. All I know is, is that that's a, that's a responsibility that I have. And so I have to carry it out as faithfully as I possibly can. I have to do it very humbly and very carefully. And I know full well that if God, uh, if God wants to remove me, he can remove me in five seconds. I mean, he can take me in a heart attack. He can take me in an airplane crash. He can take me a thousand different ways if, if God so wants it. But in the meanwhile, all I know is I have to be as faithful as possible to the Word of God. And I, and I delight to stand in the in the marketplace and get callers like yourself who want to be critical or whatever it doesn't bother me at all because I truly believe your 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 uh, when people are very critical they're arguing about what the bible is saying and that's where it ought to be we want to complete continue to look at the word of god and not at personalities but thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Brother Camping. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. Before I made my call, I had a comment to make about a show that was on your, and not critical, believe me, I love family radio, and I'll, uh, my dying day, I'll support it. But that man took up 13 minutes of your time, and he calls in more than maybe two, three times a month. That's not fair. Well, excuse me. The fact is, he calls in once a month. He's very careful about that. Well, he was, it wasn't about three weeks ago he called in. Well, if he's calling more than once a month, he's taking an awful chance that he might be cut off. It, that's the chance he's taking. But the fact is that, uh, uh, you know, this program is uh, it's out in the marketplace. And I'd like to, in some ways, it'd be nice if every caller agreed and we could just kind of sail along with nice things. But, I, you know, uh, we have to learn how to face criticism. We have to, and critics, and those who don't, don't quite understand, we have to be very patient about it. And, and uh, it's, it's, it's uh, a caller like this is an example to all of us to learn patience and and not get her dander up not not revile in return 
And that's good, healthy uh, teaching also, just as we go along. But anyway, let's not talk about that. Let's. What is your question? My first question is, on the, this, yesterday, Monday morning, there was a man on at 10.30 Eastern Time, I'm from the East, and he said, if you haven't received your a gift of eternal life, do it now. Be saved right now. And I was so shocked that I just, uh, I believe in total election. I believe that you're saved by the grace and grace alone. And I'm not trying to be critical because it could have been, maybe I even took it wrong. I don't know. But it shocked me that this man said that. Well, if, uh, let me say this. You know, we broadcast 168 hours a week. Not only that, we broadcast in a dozen different languages and have those programs to do. And we're constantly combing through them, trying to be more and more faithful. But we're not perfect, and we, we wish we could be more perfect, and, and we're aspiring to become as accurate as possible. But from time to time, there will be a, a, a slip-up. A statement will be made, and we can't recall it. It's out there. And uh, and we, uh, if we know about it, we uh, try to take some measures to make sure it doesn't happen again. But uh, thank you. And what was your other question? Okay, now this is, may sound ignorant, but my mother-in-law asked me today, how do we know what Sunday was? I said the only thing I could say that the day of the first creation was the, was the light of the sun, and that was the day of the sun. Is that where Sunday came from? No, Sunday did not come from the. The seventh day Sabbath came from the day from the seventh day of creation. Uh huh. But where did the Sunday come from? What, Sunday. Where? Sunday. Uh, we read about in in uh, Matthew 28 verse 1, for example, that God that Sunday morning. This is uh -huh. Sunday morning. God says, in the end of the Sabbath, that is an era of Sabbaths have come to an end, as it began to dawn toward the first of the Sabbaths. That Sunday morning was the beginning of a new era of Sabbath. Oh, excuse me, sir. I understand that. What well, I'm asking you, where did the name Sunday come from? Oh, excuse me. All right. The name Sunday. Oh, well, that came from a pagan name of some kind, but that uh, that doesn't mean anything. In other words, we don't worry about uh, what someone has done with these things. We just, we just, uh, 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 it's, it's just finally just a name. We don't have to worry about That's that. That's what I've told her, and thank you, Brother Camping. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Camping. Yes. Um, two things. <laughs> One, uh, your caller, uh, you had a caller who said uh, he was wondering if everybody uh, sometimes feel so terribly all alone. And I just wanted to say that um, the Bible says that we um, walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And while we don't experience that death, that eternal life, we do walk through uh, some, a form of hell. The shadow of hell sort of falls on us, and we experience those things that hell brings upon us so that um, you, you feel terribly all alone and, and people treat you really bad and, and, and you really despair and for that reason I myself am standing uh, desperately in the need of prayer but I just want to encourage the, the, the person that well, yes and as a matter of fact it's way better also when we remember that Jesus said of the believers I will never leave you nor forsake you. We might uh, feel all alone insofar as having someone else agree with what we're thinking, but if we know we're a child of God, we know that we're always under the very uh, loving care of our Savior, and He'll never abandon us. So, really, we're never alone. Oh, okay, Brother Campion, I wanted also to, um, you had a caller um, before that who was talking about um, um, when Jesus died on the cross and what hell, hell is, um, and I talked to you about this before. This is, so, this is an impromptu call, so I, I, I'll probably be stuttering along, but um, I wanted to say that um, the Bible says that um, Adam, uh, that the Lord Jesus Christ was the second Adam, and I wanted to point out that, okay, Adam disobeyed God, and the world was plunged into uh, separation from God. 
and then the, one, the, one of the primary purposes that uh, uh, the Lord accomplished when he came was to be a man and to walk that journey that Adam was supposed to walk without sin, which he did. And then he, um, he, he, and, and, and I want to, my point is about hell. Um, hell uh, ultimately is um, being separate from God, but when it talks about the, the, your earlier call, it said, um, refer to Psalms, where it says, um, Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. Well, I'm thinking that um, we, we have kind of missed what the meaning of hell is in that God having left Christ alone well when he when he walked, made that wilderness journey that Adam failed to make he had to experience all the hatred and the the scorn and the mockery and the ridicule and the beatings and then the suffering on the cross but what we we are not seeing is that hell actually is this experience not eternal hell but Hell is this experience that we're going through. Oh, excuse uh, me. We've uh -huh. got to, excuse me. We have to be very careful. Hell is the wrath of God. When people scorn us, when they, when they laugh at us, when they criticize us, that is not hell. Hell is being under the awful wrath of God. That's what Jesus endured. True. True. Uh, uh, they were shouting crucify him true they were spitting on him true they beat him they lacerated his back but that was not hell hell was being under the wrath of God and that is infinitely more terrible than all these other things but thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please welcome to open forum hello brother Camping. yes hi um, could you look at uh, Revelations 8, chapter 1? Revelation 8, verse 1, And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. Yes, uh, uh, an earlier caller who was asking about silence um, and where souls go, um, and you mentioned the fact that this is the place where the unbelievers go when uh, they die in their soul existence, uh, separated from their bodies, the unbelievers go into a place of silence. I was looking at this particular verse. Is this the same silence that's no. in heaven here that's meant, that you mentioned earlier? No, no. It's a, Could you explain that, please? It's, well, you see... Uh, uh, the gospel comes from heaven, as we read in in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 32. There's a beautiful verse there that says in uh, in verse one, uh, Deuteronomy 32: Give ear, O ye heavens, and I will speak, and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. My doctrine shall drop as rain; my speech shall distill as dew as the small rain upon the tender herb and as the showers upon the grass. In other words, the gospel comes from heaven. It is a heavenly gospel. It comes from God himself. But uh, the half hour that is addressed here in uh, Revelation 8, verse 1, it would have to be the first part of the great tribulation. There will come great tribulation. And at that time, remember that the... Uh, the uh, uh, abomination of desolation is standing in the holy place and so on. It means that during that first part, the gospel was not coming from heaven. It's a time of chaos. It's a time of great consternation. But that, that's, that's not the whole hour. Uh, God speaks of the great tribulation time as a one hour. We read in Revelation chapter uh, uh, 17, for example, we read in verse 8, uh, then shall her plagues come in one day, one day or then uh, a day or an hour is our synonyms. We read in verse 17, for in one hour so great riches is come to naught. And in the, the context of these uh, uh, statements of one hour is the whole period of the great tribulation. But in the first part of it, the gospel is is silenced and it's at the time that God has finished now with the churches and he has not yet started the latter rain. The latter rain began in the second part of the great tribulation 
uh, and and when a great multitude which no man can number are being saved and i believe we're in that part right now uh, it's uh, it, it, in other words uh, for the moment it looked like disaster total disaster for the world no more gospel but then God begins with the latter rain, and again the heavens are distilling the gospel here on the earth. But now it's going out by individuals rather than through by means of churches. Okay, thank you very much for your time, uh, Brother Ken. Thank you. And you know, this is a very parallel situation that happened at the end of the nation of Israel. For 1,500 years, God had particularly... I uh, looked upon the nation of Israel as his chosen people, as his, uh, rep to be the representation of the gospel here on this earth, and, and, uh, he cared for them and watched over them, and out of the nation of Israel came the Lord Jesus Christ. But what happened the last three and a half years? What happened the last three and a half years of God's recognition that the nation of Israel were still his particularly uh, significant nation. Christ himself, eternal God himself, was on earth bringing the gospel, the perfect preacher. Yet, virtually nobody was becoming saved. It, God was uh, almost finished with the nation of Israel, and in fact, uh, legally or officially, uh, he, he did end his his relationship with the nation of Israel at the moment that the veil of the temple was rent when Christ hung on the cross. But the three and a half years just prior to this, virtually nobody was become had become saved. There was, as it were, silence in heaven. Although the Bible doesn't use that language, but nevertheless, as we see it in in its actuality, that is what ha happened. Uh, there were a few that became saved. The Syrophoenician woman, the woman taken in adultery, uh, the thief on the cross, uh, and, and uh, a few others. But, uh, but essentially, we don't read of anyone becoming saved. And then began the 2,000 are saved because the Holy Spirit was back in operation in saving people. Now, it's very parallel to what has happened at the end of the church age. There was this short period of time, typified incidentally by three and a half days in uh, Revelation 11, where it talks about the two witnesses being killed for three and a half days. And then, then, uh, there's a great multitude which no man can number. And we end this program on that rejoicing note that right today there's a great number that no man, uh, a great multitude that no man can number being saved.